Hey, it's Josiah again. I want to have a quick video introducing you to the basics of spatial analysis. Today we'll be going over the spatial lag, and in order to do that, we got to have the spatial weights and neighbors as well. We'll be doing the exercise in the package SFDEP, which is an awesome tool that builds on the shoulders of SPDEP. If you haven't had a chance, check that out. So, as I said, our objective is to calculate the spatial lag. What is the spatial lag? Um, it's, it's the weighted average of a variable in a neighborhood. It's defined by this formula y sub or w y sub i equals the sum of w i j times y j it's it's math it's a formula <laughs> it's tough so let's break it down so i j i is the observed element of a vector the black square j is that element's neighbors in space so it's the white squares and i j refers to the neighbors of element i here we see the black square i and its neighbors j1 through j8. We also know that there's the notation y i. And since i is our focal observation, or the black square, um, y i is three. The neighboring values are around it, and those are y sub j. Now y i is the observed value at each location. So for right now, y i is the black square. But as we work through our data set, each single location will be a black square. Now, <clears throat> y sub i j. Now, this is the spatial weights for each location. And for simplicity, we're going to be using row standardized weights. And if you haven't um, learned what row standardized weights are, I'll link to a blog post. And the weights are 1 divided by the cardinality. So the cardinality is just the number of neighbors that a location has. So say, uh, for our example, that location in the middle had 8 neighbors. Now, if we look at some code to help understand this problem, we can see that the cardinality of our ith observation is eight, and we can create a vector of weights by repeating one, the number of neighbors that we have, so the cardinality, and divide by that cardinality. So wij is really just one divided by eight for all of the neighbors, they all get the same. So each, each neighbor gets the same weight, and in this case, it's 0 0.125. This is the lag all put together. So we have this vector of values, and say we want to find out what the neighbors are. We know that the observed value that in our example was five, because it was in the middle. If we count across, it's one, two, three, four, then five. And let's create a vector of the neighbor indexes. So here we have a vector containing one through four, then six through nine. Now we can use that index to subset our values to get our neighboring values, our yj. So we take that index, pass it into um, our brackets and values to subset that by position, and now we take the yj and multiply by wij. And now we can see these values, 1.05, 1.1975, 1 so on and so forth. And now if we sum it together, we get the spatial lag for that location. Now let's look at this together. On the left-hand side, we have the observed values. So these range from something close to zero, then a number close to 25. Now, if we take the spatial lag on the right-hand side, we can see that it's kind of a, it's more purple, really. Uh, and, and that's because what we're doing is we're taking the average of the neighborhood. So uh, in our example, we were looking at this location and then taking the average of everything else around it. So it's a pretty dark purple, so we're kind of close to this area on the legend here. And that's because these are in the middle and this is in the high end and this is the bottom. So if we average that out, we should get something kind of in between. Now we'll do something similar for each of these locations, right? And if we look at the, this location, we know the neighbors are what it touches. So we have this very low value, a middling value, and a, a little bit higher value. And so when we look at the average, or the spatial lag, it corresponds over here. And all of these are just the average of the neighborhood. So this thing here is the average of all of these values. Now over here, in this um, sixth observation, it's the average of these values in the bottom right corner over here where we see orange it's the average of yellow dark purple navy and orange awesome now when we look at the lag how do we understand it again it is the average value of the neighborhood or if you're familiar with econometrics it's the expected value of the neighborhood or i guess even statistics and the idea is that the lag summarizes the value of vector x or a numeric variable x for an observation i's neighborhood. Okay, now if we're using SFDEP, 
And again, SFDEP is a tidy interface to the R package SPDEP, really great tools. So the first step here is we have to identify the neighbors. And the simplest way we can do that is by using the function stContiguity. An stContiguity takes an SF object or an SFC object, um, which is a spatial representation of vector data. Now, by default, it provides us with queen contiguity. So th that is, if you don't recall, when things share sides. <laughs> so uh, in our observation, we were looking at queen contiguity because they all have the same sides or corners, actually. <clears throat> now, this is an example where we take the data set GURI from the package SFDEP and um, identify the neighbors. Now, this is what gets printed out when we have the neighbors, but let's, let's look, dig into it a little bit more. This is an NB class object from SPDEP. And um, it might help us to look at the attributes of this. So the first thing we see is it's an NB class and it also has a class list. So I have a good hunch that it's actually an, a list class under the hood. Then there's some other attributes associated with it. We can see that the type is queen and we know that it is a symmetrix wait list. So NB class objects are sparse matrix. Each element in that ND list is an integer vector, where elements are row positions of their neighbors. So here we can see the first three observations of that neighbor list. That the first observation has neighbors in the row position 36, 37, 67, and 69. The second observation has neighbors at row position 7, 49, 57, 58, 73, and 76. And that's going to continue all the way down through our entire neighbor list for every single observation in our data set. Now, spatial weights. We use the function stWeights, which takes a neighbor list as its input. And by default, the weights are row standardized. Again, that is equal weight, one divided by the number of neighbors that there are. And this returns a list. Each element is a numeric vector with the same cardinality as the neighbor list and it contains the weight for the corresponding element in that neighbor list. And again, reminder, cardinality means number of neighbors. Okay, so here we create an object called WT or weight, and we'll look at the first three elements and see that these are all equal weight all the way across. Now let's calculate the lag. Here we have a variable we're assigning to X, which is the amount of crime in our data set. And then we're calculating the lag using the function stlag, where we provide the numeric vector, in this case x, then the neighbor list, and then the weight. And this is the spatial lag for every single place. Now, we can calculate this by hand by using the list just to get an intuition. Let's look at um, our neighbor, and we'll take the first element of that list and store it in a, an object called ij. Then we'll take the wait list, take the first element, and store it into an object called wij. And now we're going to subset x based on that index, ij, and assign it to xij. So now we'll multiply xij by wij and get these values. And if we sum them all up, we get 23,000. If we go back, we can see that the first value, again, was 23,000. So now you should hopefully have an uh, intuition of how to calculate the lag by hand, which should make you hopefully feel a bit more comfortable when we're actually looking at what that lag is. All right, now using dplyr. The reason why sfdep is so cool is because it works so well with dplyr. Now let's again look at the data set for Guri about France in the 1850s, I think. It's a very famous data set. Now we can actually do this all in one step because we're using dplyr. So we can, in a, a, trans, a transmute, so transmute is the same thing as mutate, but it just returns the rows that you, or the columns that you create. Identify the neighbors by passing in the geometry column to ST contiguity. Then we can calculate the weights by passing in the neighbor list to ST weights. And then we can create a new lag variable by using ST lag and passing in that column, the neighbors and the weights. Now, the next part of this, we're going to recreate this chart that we see right here. All right, now that we've gone over what the fundamentals of the, S the spatial lag are, let's actually look at how we do this in R Studio. So first things first, let's open up a new R script, and then we're gonna load sfdep, and then the tidyverse. This is gonna be super, super quick. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna load the GURI dataset, and it's from package sfdep. Now we can look at it, and let's pass it into the function view. 
we can see all of our all of our variables in the values they take. And just for sanity purposes, let's look at the uh, geometry. Let's load SF. That's that's what's missing here. I've never pressed that button before. Okay, library SF. Let's pull out the geometry from Gurry and plot it. Beautiful. So this is a map of France. And each location in this data set is one of these districts in France. And the associated data is uh, that we're going to look at is for each of these places. So what we're going to do now is we're going to identify what the neighbors are for each location by using um, ST. Uh, contiguity and we're going to be using queen contiguity contiguity so any of these places that share a side or a vertex um, will become a neighbor so what we're going to do is we're going to take gurry we're going to pass it into a mutate function we're going to say nb equals st contiguity and then since our um, geometry is stored in a column called geometry sometimes it's called x but most often it's called geometry we're going to pass in that column to the st contiguity function. Now, one of the unfortunate, unfortunate problems is that it gets appended all the way at the end of the data set. So what I like to do while I'm developing here is pass in the function transmute because all we get back is this um, column that we created. And just to illustrate, let's pull out that MB uh, column and we see that it's a neighbor list. Beautiful. So now what we can do is we can take that resultant column and use it in the st weights function. So now if we do this, we see we get a weight with the same lengths uh, for each observation. So the first observation has four neighbors, it has four weight values, so on and so forth. So these will all have the same cardinality. Now, the next thing I wanna do is, let's put this back into a mutate. Let's look at, uh, our Gurry data set. And the thing that I'm interested in is this crime. I think this is, uh, I don't know the difference between crime purse and prop, but we're gonna use crime purse in this situation. So let's just, before we look, do anything, look at that and see how it's distributed. So we're passing the Gurry data set into ggplot. We're going to map our fill pattern equal to crime, P-E-R-S, and we're going to use geomsf. Now down below, we can see the basic ggplot, and um, I really don't like the basic colors here, so I'm gonna do some things to spruce it up to make it easier to understand. So we're gonna say color equals black. We're going to say LWD for line width is 0 0.15. We're gonna use scale viridis C, and I'm gonna use a theme void. Great. So we can see that this, the brighter the yellow, that the higher value there is for a location. And the darker purple it is, the lower that value is. So we can see kind of in the center of France, we have this location with a high value or a high amount of crime. And down in the south of France, we have a fair amount lower. And um, yeah, I think that's generally the pattern is more north, we see higher clusters of crime. And down low, we see uh, less crime. But the question then is, how does this compare to its neighbors? And that's why we're calculating this lag. So now we'll say crime lag, going back to our mutate statement, equals st lag, crime PERS, NBWT. And I'm going to move this up here while I'm thinking about it. So we have this lag created now. But Let's visualize it too. So let's call this, let's call this crime lags. And we'll do the same thing. Let's just copy this. And we're gonna put in crime lags. And the fill is gonna be crime lag. Now we can see that these locations tend to have a little bit of a smoother transition in colors. We can see that this location, um, in the center of France is more green than it was in this other map. But one thing we'll notice is that the 
the, the range of values is different in the first than it is in the second. And that's because this, the facial lag is an average of the neighbors and it's creating the smoothing pattern. So everything is kind of being pulled closer to the average value of that um, variable as is. And maybe a, a good way to understand this is if we look at the histograms of the two of them, and I'm going to be lazy and use base R plots. So if we look at crime lags and pass it in crime uh, PERS, we can see that this ranges from 5,000 to 40,000. And let's look at how this is for crime lag. Now we range only from 10,000 to somewhere over 30,000. So now we're getting kind of closer to our average value, which if we look at this is crime lags, crime first. And that's just kind of a characteristic of uh, sampling distributions, right? If you all took an econometrics class, I'm sure you had to go through that, that um, sampling exercise where you sample from a variable five times, 10,000 times, and see how the distribution changes uh, as your sample size gets bigger. Cool, so um, what we're gonna do now is actually we're gonna change the scale in here to say um, the, the limits of our, our scale is gonna be the minimum and maximum of the uh, non-lagged variable. So what we'll do is we're gonna say limits equals, uh, let's do range, jury, prime, first, and I think that'll do it. Great, so now compared to this, it's less vibrant, but it's a better representation of what we had before. And so I'm just going to copy and paste this to what we had up here. Great. So what we're going to call, we're going to call this crime OBS for observed. I'll say prefix it with GG. <laughs> and then we'll say GG crime lag. And then what else we can do actually is use this package called patchwork and we're going to wrap our plots like a gg crime obs and gg crime lag beautiful so now we can see these two plots side by side and if we look at this one location again it's very very bright but now that we're taking the average of these locations it becomes much more green we're probably somewhere around like 2400 24,000 excuse me and uh, similarly, we have locations like this one, which are very low, but now as we're averaging these two places, it becomes more green. And that's kind of how we wanted to build this intuition of the spatial lag. So hopefully you understand the spatial lag is just the average value of a variable for a location for its neighborhood, right? So we have this location, the lag is just the average of these locations. It doesn't include the observed value, right? It's just the ones around. Okay, great, y'all. I hope that was helpful and informative.